of people think that insects, reptiles, frogs and toads, little mammals are all pests in the garden. But we disagree. We think that if all those things are there, it's a sign that you have a healthy environment. Instead of imagining that nature has surrounded the garden with enemies, we like to imagine that she's surrounded it with allies. And thus, we've planted a border here specifically to attract insects. I'm Elliot Coleman. And I'm Barbara Damrosh. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll show you how to create a balanced environment in your yard on Gardening Naturally. really pleased when I've managed to put together a flower border like this that's filled with lots of vibrant colors. You know, I like the mixture. I like to come out here and look at it. But that's not my only criterion, because I think I'm also creating a little ecosystem here. After all, flowers serve a purpose. They're there for pollinating insects to get nectar, and they're also there to feed caterpillars that turn into butterflies and other wonderful things like that. So what really gets me excited is when I look at my butterfly weed and it's covered with caterpillars of the monarch butterfly. Similarly, over here, I've got some pearly everlasting that I cut back after it finished blooming, but there's still plenty of foliage for the American painted lady butterfly to build her little nests. That's what gets me excited. Now, I'm not only thinking about daytime and butterflies and flowers that bloom by day. I also like to think about what happens at night. There are a lot of flowers that bloom at night or are especially fragrant at night, and those are for moths and other night-flying pollinators. For instance, over here, my nicotiana is in full bloom right now and also in full fragrance because we're getting towards the end of the day. Here's another one. My little old-fashioned petunias get more and more fragrant as the evening progresses. But here's a little bit more subtle night-fragrant plant that I want to show you. This is what I wanted you to see over here. It's night-scented stock, that little purple flower. Doesn't look like much during the day, just closed up buds like these. But as the day starts to fade, it opens up and sends a beer through my screen door so I can smell it in the kitchen. Now, if I planted a mass of it, all I'd see would be bare ground in the daytime. So I've put it among some zinnia linearis. So this looks pretty by day, too. Now, in order to make the world safe for luna moths and other beautiful night flyers, I urge you not to put up one of those bug zappers. It isn't going to attract mosquitoes anyway, because they're not attracted to light. It'll just kill a lot of lovely and harmless night insects. I ordered some beneficial insects by mail, and they just arrived. Second day air, and it says on here, living beneficial insects, do not overheat, please rush. And since they've rushed them to me, I'm going to get them right into the garden. Now, in order to come successfully through the mail, beneficial insects are packed so they'll travel. And in this case, they're in a little protective plastic box. And inside there, there is a little frozen piece to keep them cool, and then the insects. When most people get insects by mail, they think of something like lady beetles or praying mantises that you're going to be able to see. Well, these are actually almost invisible. And according to the label, there are one million little creatures in here. And what they are is a beneficial nematode. This is a nematode that will go down into the soil and on a search and destroy mission for cutworms, army worms, a lot of those unpleasant creatures that can live in your soil. Now the way to deal with this is to open it up very quickly and you'll see that there's a little sponge in here and when they're shipped, the nematodes soak their way into this sponge and I want to take it out as quickly as possible and get it into some water. And according to the directions, I mix this in with a gallon of water, open it up, and encourage all those little nematodes to come out of this sponge and into the water. Now, what I get from it then is my concentrated solution. And I'm going to use this concentrated solution then to dilute in water because this number of nematodes will protect 2,000 square feet of garden. So I'm going to take my concentrated solution once I have everything stirred up well here and take just under a cup of water out of it because 
I want to cover about 100, oh, 100 square feet now, and that means about a 20th of what it'll do. And I will pour it into this watering can and mix that up. Now I have my working solution, and the trick then is to water it onto the soil. And I will put it over this whole 100 square foot area here, just sprinkling it in there. Now, just doing that isn't enough because the real key to getting these little fellows established is to make sure that they can get down into the soil with that moisture. So after I put them on, I come along with another watering can of just plain water and really water them in so they'll get down into the soil where they're going to be safe and be able to go to work. Now, whenever I import any beneficial insect, I always think, gee, is there some imbalance? If I have pests, why wouldn't I have their predator here? And that's a good way to think. And so I usually research anything I import and try and figure out how I can create what's needed for them to be here. And what is needed is a beneficial habitat. Now, for soil-dwelling insects like this, the important thing is to have plenty of organic matter in the soil and to have a soil that's loose and open, very much like you would have for plants to grow, that is moist but not overly soggy. For flying insects, the important thing is that they have protection and they have food. Now, there are a lot of wonderful flying beneficial insects, like lacewings and like the wasps and flies that are beneficial, and they are pretty unique. What they need for food and protection are certain flowers that have just the right size for them to get in there and get pollen and the type of place where they can hide. And I learned a lot about this years ago when I read an article about an orchard study that compared two abandoned orchards that weren't being sprayed anymore. And they found in one orchard, 90% of the apples were totally unblemished. In the other orchard, only 10% were unblemished. Now that was pretty amazing, so they investigated what was growing in the understory underneath the trees. And they found the unblemished orchard had in it all the type of flowers, what are called insectary plants, that the little beneficial insects can hide in when they're waiting around. The other orchard had none of those. So taking a tip from that, whenever I'm thinking about trying to create better habitat for beneficial insects in my garden, I think, what can I do to create just the living conditions they want? And we've done just that next to the orchard. Gardening Naturally will return on TLC. Furniture to go, weekdays at 5 on TLC. Remember the last time you were able to see clearly without eyeglasses or contacts? Well, now there's a safe, effective way to see like a kid again. Eczema laser correction of nearsightedness. Ask your eye doctor. Remember the last time you were able to see clearly without eyeglasses or contacts? Well, now there's a safe, effective way to see like a kid again. Eczema Laser Correction of Nearsightedness. Call now. If you've ever struggled with a handheld trimmer, you'll love this revolutionary new kind of trimmer on wheels. Just look how easy it rolls on those two big wheels and glides in any direction on this front-mounted mobile. It's perfect for trimming around rocks, along fences, buildings, sidewalks, and in all those hard-to-reach corners. The new DR is also a mower. It cuts tall grass, waist-high weeds, even wet grass and rough areas with never-before-eat. There's no steel blade to bend or dull. You'll just love what the DR trimmer mower can do for you and your property. You can get free shipping now for a limited time. Call toll-free 1-800-490-7272. That's 1-800-490-7272 for a big color catalog all about the revolutionary DR trimmer mower. This is a love story. Special delivery from TLC. But not just any love story. It's all about genes, chromosomal romance, DNA, the dance of life. The inside story of how babies are made. Childbirth in all its glory. It's a mother and child love story. Friday, beginning at 8 on TLC. Gardening Naturally now returns on TLC. 
first step in creating a balanced environment in your garden is to get rid of your fear of nature. Now, you remember as a little kid, we all read stories about the big bad wolf and dark forests, and I can understand how that has given people this idea that nature may have some malevolent parts, and there probably are places where they are malevolent, but not in my garden. In my garden, I always try and think positively with curiosity and understanding. Take this field I'm standing in here. This border I planted on purpose to contain all sorts of different flowers, shrubs, other things. This happens to be a buckwheat flower. Over there is a dill plant, clover blossoms. These are all known to provide ideal food sources for all sorts of little beneficial insects. The type of insects that I would like to have around my garden in order to create balance. Now, if I had put my garden instead in the middle of a large mowed lawn, I would have created with the vegetables a place where the insects that balance the vegetables could come, but I wouldn't have created any habitat for their balances. And in nature, that never happens. In nature, there are habitats, there's diversity, all of these things work together. And my role as a gardener is to see that nature is beneficial, understand her parts, and then try and use them to create in my yard and around my garden as much diversity of habitat as possible in order to get that balance. What could be out of balance in your garden beside just the habitat around it? Oh, the soil could be too compacted, or it could be too wet, or too dry. Now, in nature, when those conditions exist, there are plants that naturally come in because they can stand those conditions, but your vegetables can't. So you want to create in your vegetable garden the conditions that are ideal for vegetables. I've just been putting some old hay mulch around this apple orchard that I'm trying to bring back. I'm putting it there because I know from experience that that mulch breaks down at about just the rate that the apple tree needs food coming down into the soil. I'm trying to create a balance between the tree's needs and what I'm feeding it with, rather than feeding it with something that's going to give it too much. Now, there are problems in this old orchard. That's why I'm slowly working to bring it back. And I could go in there negatively and say, OK, I'm going to deal with these problems. It really doesn't work anywhere near as well as going in there positively and saying, I'm going to work slowly to create conditions that are ideal for the apple trees. That is the successful way to get a balanced environment. And think about this positive and negative thing for just one second in your own life. What would be more pleasant? Spending all your time doing negative things for your supposed enemies or spending all your time doing positive things for your friends? of the garden we called the dead zone. Nothing will grow here. We've planted so many different things here, we can't even remember what the dead things are. The only thing that comes back is Johnny jump ups and a few useless weeds. We've tried tilling and compost, everything we can do to improve the soil. No luck. Annuals we plant here die. Finally, we figured out what was going on. It's the sunflower seeds that the birds are scattering from this bird feeder. And what happens is a process called allelopathy. And that's when a plant manufactures a toxin in the surrounding soil that keeps other plants from growing. And sunflowers are among those plants. Black walnut trees will do the same thing. If you've ever tried growing tomato plants under a black walnut tree, you won't get any tomatoes. We've finally given up. Instead of trying to beat our heads against this situation, we're going to take a more drastic tack. And we're going to make a little mini flagstone terrace just for the birds. What I've done here is removed about half a wheelbarrow load of soil. Stone flags with their irregular side up, about 12 inches by 18 inches, to kind of match this bluestone edging that I had here before. I'm filling in the cracks and I'm even replanting all those little Johnny jump ups that were my sole survivors and I hope they'll continue to thrive here. Now, what I have is a nice level spot to set a bird bath. This will also give the birds a nice place to peck at those seeds when they fall. I love this little area. 
And I never would have thought of putting it in if I hadn't had a problem with allelopathy. One of the keys to a balanced environment in your vegetable garden is to run a crop rotation. Now, a crop rotation is simply the idea of moving what you grew here this year to someplace else next year. There's a wonderful old story about the successful Midwestern corn and soybean grower who claimed that his crop rotation was corn, soybeans, and Florida. In other words, during the winter season when neither corn nor soybeans were growing, he moved himself to a warmer climate. Well, without moving yourself anywhere, you can do a crop rotation in your home garden. Just divide your garden in half and grow half of the crops on this side, half on that side, and then next year shift. Move those crops over here and move these crops over there. The benefit from that is that you're getting a little bit more diversity. And in nature, diversity always means stability in systems. And studies have shown that if you grow the same crop year after year in the same soil, you end up with a buildup of the pests and diseases that bother that crop. Obviously, something you want to avoid. Now, there are many refinements of crop rotation. They come from your experience, hints from friends and neighbors, and things you learn in books. And you can make these as complicated as you want. But they aren't really complicated, because by doing it, you're adding to your fascination with how your garden grows. In fact, there's a great way to get involved in this and not only learn things yourself, but involve the family by turning the planning of your garden into a really fun board game. Come on over here and I'll show you. What we have here is the crop rotation game. Who knows, soon to be in board game stores everywhere. If you want to start at home, the easiest way is to just get three by five cards and write the names of the crops you're growing in your garden on them, and then you can start moving them around. I have so much fun with this that over the years I've collected refrigerator magnets. We're gonna work here with trying to find a rotation for eight crops or eight crop families. And that's gonna be the tomato family represented by tomatoes and peppers, the cabbage family, cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli, the squash cucumber group, peas, 